Lori, can you introduce yourself to the Mom Curious crowd? Absolutely. Um, my name is Lori Hawksteeful. Nobody can actually ever pronounce any of my names. So um, that's yeah, why so. I asked you to introduce yourself, actually. I was like, I'm not going to even go there. I'm not no, even going to try. No. No, it's like, it's literally, it gets butchered like every single time. Like when I get called at doctor's office, I have, I'm like waiting around for 10 minutes until I realize, oh, wait, that's actually me. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm Lori. I work for the head office of PJ Library. I am what we call an engagement officer, and I get to um, work with some really cool communities and talk about books and talk about engagement and how to connect people to each other. It's really a dream job, to be honest. What do you mean? How is this your dream job? I mean, it's great. I get a chance to meet people all over the country, actually all over U.S. and Canada and beyond. Um, And we get to talk about ways to connect people to each other, to help people create their own villages. Um, You know, PJ, and and PJ is like kind of that starting point. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing to be doing this kind of work. Well, I'll say that um, PJ Library is a big mainstay in my home. Um, nice. My kids really love the books. Like, they love the books. I, I So, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but so we signed up for PJ Library with my son, who's five and a half, when he was just a baby. And yeah. we've been getting free books. Um, it's not once a month, is it? It's once. It is. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's- Wow. Yeah, it's like amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's totally amazing. So you can get books starting now at newborn. So uh, can I tell you, I've had friends literally text me from the hospital. Like, I wish I was kidding. How do I sign up? Like, let me let me sign up ASAP. Um, So yeah, newborns um, through eight years old and kids get a free book every single month. And actually in December, we send out really fun gifts um, in addition to that. So you might have seen on social really cool um, aprons. Yeah. Um, we've sent uh, yeah, we've sent all sorts of really cool things over the years. And then um, and then after PJ Library, we actually have something that your kids will hopefully enjoy eventually. Um, my two older ones are enjoying. It. It's called PJ Our Way. So like starting at eight and a half, um, they can choose their own books every single month, choose an amazing chapter oh, book. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, Except well, in our house, like we have to coordinate because my two older ones, they have to coordinate like who's getting what. So that way we're not getting doubles. They're mm-hmm. not choosing the same So books. interestingly, I was just going to say that like, so now that my three-year-old is signed up also, I'm really seeing that you're thinking this through because um, my daughter gets a different book than my son gets based on their ages. And yeah. And actually, I'm noticing that we don't have many, we have some doubles, but not many, even though, you know, at three, my son was getting books from you guys every month for free. And I just want to say, like, you don't have to be Jewish to sign up for this. Like, they are Jewish themed, but they're, but they're gorgeous books. I mean, they're just like, so um, well done and um, inclusive. it's like really, it, sometimes it moves me to tears. I mean, it oh, really, yeah. they're, they're just, they're beautiful and it's generous and I don't know how you do it. Um, I'd love it's, for you to tell me how and the why, because whenever I share sure. this, whenever I share the, um, you know, I'll share like videos of my kids reading. They're, one of their yeah. favorite books is Mo and Mo. Um, mm-hmm. but partially because one of the, um, the store that, you know, this like, chance encounter um takes place at is right down the block from us and there's a oh, Muslim that's so fun. Yeah, there's a Muslim kid and a Jewish kid yeah. and they get together and and they sort of run away and their their moms are looking for them. Anyway, they love this book and I share it online and people are awesome. always hitting me up being like I love PJ Library. So oh, I, think, I love hearing that. That never gets yeah. old for me. Um yeah, the books I mean the books how. are amazing. We want to know how and we want to know why. Um, so if Absolutely. you can walk us through that, that would be awesome. Totally. Um, so yeah, so PJ Library, um, we provide free age appropriate, highly curated books for families raising Jewish children. So any grown up can go on and sign up their kids to receive books. Um, it's really easy. They're free. They come right to the home. Um, actually, my uh, my youngest, who's seven, um, she got her book yesterday. And like, it never gets old. Like she sees her name on the envelope. She rips it to pieces, of course, the envelope. There's, so there's paper confetti everywhere. Um, and she just, she gets an amazing book. 
every single month. And um, as a mom, like what I really appreciate it is I don't have to think hard about bringing quality Jewish content books into my house. Like when I was a kid, which feels like a bazillion years ago, like these books were not available. There wasn't these great stories. And that's kind of part of our origin story. Um, our founder, Harold Grinspoon, who is amazing. He's 93. He's got more energy than anyone else you've ever met in your life. Um, he was really inspired by Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. He heard the story one day on NPR and he's like, what would that look like if we created something for families raising Jewish children? And that's how the idea was born. And um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's truly incredible. We actually just celebrated a huge milestone in August. So we've been around for 15 years. We celebrated our 50 millionth book that we oh, sent out. Wow. Like, could you, could you imagine that? Um, it's, it's just beyond. It's it's really amazing. And we are in, um, how many countries are we in right now? We are in 36 countries around the world. Mm. We are in seven languages. More than 675,000 books are sent out each month to families. And it's just, it's, it's this amazing connection. Like, you know, so my family, so I'm, I'm originally from Montreal and oh, my yeah. sister's kids are, yeah, my sister's kids are the same age as my kids. And when they were younger, they were getting the same books as my kids. And that just felt really special because, you know, we don't get a chance to see each other all that often, but they have this connection. They have this shared language and these shared stories. And um, I, I think that's magical, honestly. Yeah. I, you know, I think there's something really um, Jewish about literacy you know, I think like we've had this book, it's called the Torah, um, for yeah. thousands and thousands of years, literacy in general, um, you know, it was a huge milestone in, in like the bar mitzvah age. I, of course, now there are girls that get, get bat mitzvah, but reading that book was a huge part of yeah. child rearing. And, and we see that, yeah. um, you know, books bring people together. I see it in my own um, experience that like, you know, when I bring these books into my home and I, I was raised very religious, you know, the do's and don'ts of Judaism. And right. I don't really practice in that way. But the stories, the the legends, the mythology, when they serve, I am so happy yeah. to pass that on. Um, and I feel like these these books are sort of taking that tradition, that storytelling tradition, and yeah. moving it forward. And what I love about them, and I, I would love for you to maybe talk on this point, is the inclusivity that that I experience in um, yeah. in these books and how you cure. I'm not sure how you curate them. Um, and mm -hmm. if you could actually, when I say how, I really am saying like who's working behind the scenes how do you get them to us for free how do you what like what does it take to do this in so many countries in so many languages um in the, you know i i really do want to know how because it's so inspiring yeah. um but i'm 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 really curious about the curation because i see families represented here with two moms or two dads um, with an array of, um, you know, cultures, ethnicities, and races, I see, yeah. um, a varying, um, expression of the Jewish, um, culture and religion and language. And I just, how, how do you, how did you make that happen and why? Yeah. Yeah. No, so many good questions. Um, you know, I think, first of all, we have a tremendous team of children's lit experts who, um, like me, we're all obsessed with books. And so they make it their mission to find and curate these credible, incredible books. And I think what's also really neat is we seek out authors and we, we have um, all sorts of workshops that help um, that help authors move along. If they're, if, 
we want we want to cultivate more authors who tell their own stories and own voices. And I think that piece really ref- is starting to really reflect in what we're sharing. And I think with inclusivity, I think once upon a time, you know, the books that were out there again, like especially you know when I was younger, it really represented a very Ashka normative, like a very Ashkenazi Eastern European centric background. Um, I mean, I'm I'm Ashkenazi, but growing up, my my best friend is an Iraqi Jew, and like we have very different origin stories. We have very different and backgrounds. traditions and language. And it was and looks abs- a- absolutely, nice. yeah. And it was so fun. Like we always shared, but like it was my story, my family's type story that was always shared, and like we didn't, we never saw her family's story shared. And so I think it's really beautiful that we're now seeing the gorgeous diversity of Judaism being represented in books. And it's this idea of like windows and mirrors. We want to be able to see, you know, kids really want to be able to see themselves in books and they want to see some of their traditions in books, maybe some ways that they're celebrating in their own home. And so again, you know, maybe may, even with family structure, kids really want to see themselves. And quite frankly, adults oh, yeah. do too. Um, we Did wanna you see, see that video? We want to see. Did you see that video? Oh God, it was so magnificent. Like. Did you see these little black girls watching um, the Little Mermaid, the new Little Mermaid, who's black? Oh and my God! Like, oh my God! First of all, oh my God! The, the way. Oh, oh my the God! Chills. They were so excited. And they felt so seen. Yeah. And they couldn't believe it also that the yes. disbelief was a little sad for me to experience to witness like why why is this so rare for you babe you know like wow Mm -hmm. to feel like you matter and and that is oh my god it's a game changer I think that's probably why particularly my son who really loves books loves the PJ library books because he he enjoys all books but to see himself to see himself is so cool. And also he lives in Brooklyn. And so he has, you know, um, friends with two dads and two moms. And he has friends who's oh, yeah. one of them, you know, one parent isn't Jewish or one is a, one is mm-hmm. converted or, you know, a, a, a black Jew or a Sephardic Jew. You know, like he has this very diverse experience. Yeah. And so to feel seen, to feel seen. It is so powerful. It's so, it really is. And it's interesting that you're saying that because like on the flip side, so again, being from Montreal, I live in the South. I live in Charleston, South Carolina. And so my kids don't see Jewish, many Jewish people around them. So all of a sudden when they're seeing these books, they're able to be, they're exposed to so right. much more right. than what they have physically around them. And it makes, it makes such right. a difference. It really helps them um, celebrate their own Jewish identity. Um, so going back to kind of like how, yeah, how? this all happens, um, we have very, we have, I, I mean, first of all, I toured our warehouse recently. It was like, I was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, there was like bazillions of books all around me. It was amazing. And based where our offices are based in Western Massachusetts. And we have incredible donors Beautiful. all over the world who help make this magic happen. And we, especially in, in, in our community. So we have about 190 communities or so within the U.S. and Canada who help implement PJ Library. So in any community, it might be a Jewish federation, it might be a Jewish community center who says, this is so important to us. Jewish continuity, Jewish literacy, this is important to us. And we are going to find the people who will help make this happen. So it's not, I mean, it's not a free program, obviously. The books cost money, but it's free to families. And that piece, um, it's a gift, it's a, there's no strings attached. Oh my gosh, and that's really to name. Feel, like that's why I'm saying how like, and why. Yeah. I'm like, what? You know, I'm so used know, to right? a world where, you know, I'm being asked of, and I I'm like, how what, how and why are mm-hmm. you giving this to me? I mean, there's there's totally. a long um, there's a long history of not um, not proselytizing as Jews. You know, like we, I mean, we do right, Kira, right. which is something that that. that um, yeah, which is like outreach, outreach yeah. like bringing people closer. But there's no, there's no um, missionary work for for Jews. But you know, I think it is sort of a, a sort of fantastic experience where I'm like, wait, you're giving me something, and I'm not giving you anything. Right. I mean, I happen to 
be talking to you on this podcast, but only because I'm experiencing that when I share these books and I share my children's joy of yeah. books that my whole community like with a huge uproar uproar says like oh, we love pj library we want to understand more about them we want to understand how it works and the as i keep saying why and it really is like mind-boggling yeah. in a world where we're always being uh asked of that you ask nothing of us i know no no and it's true and that's the thing is it's truly a gift mm-hmm. and like even kind of going beyond the books, we have some incredible resources. First of all, our website is chock full of great blog posts. We have, um, you can find all sorts of books. If you're looking for a book for, say, like on a specific value, like on Tikkun Olam, like repairing the world, you can easily find that on our website. We've got activities, we've got recipes. Um, we have a huge social media presence. Um, we we have a podcast. We have PJ Presents. We offer podcasts for kids. I'm mean, actually the second season of Afternoons with Mimi and Beyond Bookcase just launched. My kids love these podcasts because, again, they hear characters that are similar to them. Um, and on our website, we have... Um, we have what we call our holiday hubs. So if you're just even curious, like about like what is this Hanukkah thing that's coming up? Like we have all these great resources um, that you can check out to learn more about the holiday. Um, I think it's kind of like what you were mentioning earlier um, with, you know, that PJ really applies to so many different families and so many different family structures. And some of the stories I feel like I love the most is when I hear from families and they they're learning along with their kids, especially if maybe someone didn't grow up with a Jewish background, maybe they're Jewish by choice. Like they are learning in a very easy kind of non-threatening way. And, you know, the approach we take, it's not prescriptive. Like we're not telling you this is how you need to do things, but we're giving you the tools to explore. I think that's a basic piece of being Jewish. Mm -hmm. We ask questions. We are always (laughs) looking for more. Um, And then also just kind of going beyond the books in many of our communities, there are local PJ library kind of chapters, um, no pun intended, um, that are looking to help connect families to each other. So there's programs, there's all sorts of initiatives, um, all sorts of really cool experiences. So you can go out and and meet other families. It's incredible. um, This Friday, I was invited to a Shabbat dinner where um, the host is getting a grant from PJ Library to to host mm-hmm. several yeah. families. And I like, yeah. I'm supposed to bring the babka and, and the receipt for the babka and get reimbursed for it, you know, just to build community. Yeah, it's um, amazing. And it really is something. Yeah. I also, you know, I happen to be one of the voices on... Um, one of your podcasts, I, I play Rapunzel. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Yeah. How did I not realize and, that? Um, and what's so beautiful is that the um, the uh, the writer, producer, and, and uh, voice of many of, of these um, podcasts, it, I, I, I think she, uh, they converted and they did. their uh, sort of uh, beautiful curiosity and passion mm-hmm. around... Jewish learning, Jewish ideas, Jewish identity is so beautiful. And I just wanted to give a shout out to that, um, you know, to, to the podcasts and to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the creator of, of those podcasts, because I, I love that experience. I, I'm such a big fan of like, like c- converse in general. I just think it's such a cool thing. Um, so they say that like, yeah. you know, they, they may or may not have always had a Jewish soul and this like returning yeah. back is, is really like magical to watch. And I, you know, the, my podcast is called mom curious. So I'm, I, I'm a fan of curiosity. I am like, yeah, I, I'm big into it. So it was really beautiful for me to meet them and, and to, to collaborate on that. So, yeah. Uh, I love that. They're, they are an incredible human. And I think, you know, it, it kind of makes me think also there's like a childlike wonder when you are Jewish by choice. There's this curiosity that um, th- just seeking more information, yeah. just like our children. And I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Again, I, I, I think so much of what we do is just keeping, keeping to ask the questions, like asking more questions, wanting to learn more. 
um, wanting to explore so many different um, traditions, yeah. which I think is so much I, fun. I um, sing in Yiddish. And so like, I have like a real understanding of, oh my gosh, how did this culture survive? And the culture survived um, from writing and reading oh, yeah. and singing and dancing because it's not actually that intuitive um, to, you know, for an indigenous peoples who were in the, you know, spread out in the diaspora for thousands of years. Yeah. The fact that we, that, that your Iraqi Jewish neighbor and you as an Ashkenazi Jew landed in Montreal and still connected on Shabbat or holidays yeah. on the same day at the same time it's is so miraculous magical. and it has everything to do with literacy. And I, I say that because, mm -hmm. of course, this is not a, a Jewish podcast. I happen to be Jewish, but I, I think right. there is a really interesting note for us all that like there is something and it, it's not around preservation. It is around progress. Actually, there's something really beautiful mm -hmm. about knowing um, about pointing to stories, sharing yeah. them. Um, and having them written down that, that was, that was so interesting to me that these stories yeah. that were written down, that these Yiddish, uh, songs that were written down could even survive yeah. through world war II. Um, it's, it, the know, power it's in books, the power in, uh, connecting, um, in this, in this art form through writing yeah. and reading is so gorgeous to me. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's funny. So I actually used to do, my parents' first language is Yiddish. So I grew really? up hearing Yiddish in the home. I used to do Yiddish theater in Montreal. Yes, and, um, yes. actually we so have that connection, like, Bryna Wasserman. Yeah, yeah. She was, she was my director way back in the day. Me too. And, we got you know, a was, Drama Desk nomination because of her. She directed us in, she, she directed me um, off Broadway in a play called um, the Golden Land, and uh, it was oh, very it was successful. Golden Land in Montreal. Oh, that's amazing! I think. Oh my Sadie. gosh, we have so we have so much we have so much to talk about. That is so fun. Um, but yeah, it's it's you know again the, these what I love like just thinking about like these these classic stories and then these reimagining of stories. I'm um, actually picked up uh, one of our new books. It's called Hanukkah at Monica. It's PJ Library. We have our own publishing house too. And what I love about it, it's a re, it, it takes the values of, uh, of the tradition and then it reimagines it for a new time. And so I think that part for me is also so special that with the written story, it's like, yes, we're holding on to traditions, but we're also exploring new traditions and reimagining new ways of telling a story that feels relatable. Um, cause you know, not all of us were in the shtetl, not all of us were, you know, um, dancing around to klezmer music at all times, which I happen to love, but you know, it's, but how do we take those stories and tell them in a really fresh way that our kids will love? And, um, it's true. It's, it's truly incredible. I mean, I get excited when I see the new lineup every month of all the books that we have. And just again, all the resources, um, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's really impressive. I often talk to people about Jewish representation um, in Hollywood and in you know, film, TV, and theater. And it's not that we're not represented, but how are we represented? And I'm just, yes. you know, I'm really reminded that, like, in most of the world, you know, outside of Israel, Jews don't live in a Jewish country. And so... No. What our children watch on television is a sort of mainstream culture where they are not represented, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fully. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, we love Daniel Tiger and we love. Of course. We love all the PBS shows and um, the holidays that they celebrate don't really apply to my family. And um, right. this is sort of alternate media in a sense. You know, I, I think like with the podcast that you're creating and the, um, the books that you're offering, you're just supplementing their, their childhood with, I see you, I see you, you matter, I see yeah. you. 
Yeah. 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 And, and helping them not feel othered. I think in the world that we're in right now, it, it, again, like it can feel difficult. Again, living in the South, we, we really feel that. And I feel like, um, especially for our families who live in areas where there isn't a Jewish community center, it, it these books are more important. Um, actually, something something that's super cool. So I mentioned earlier that we have you know 190 communities across the U.S. and Canada, but our funders also said, hey, what about those families who live in other places where there isn't like a Jewish center, where there aren't funders? Like we need to still get these families books. And in the U.S., we what it's what we call the all access community or national community. And so right now we have over 18,000 subscribers who live in pockets all around the U.S. who aren't necessarily close to anything Jewish. And we said it is so like you matter. We want you to be part of this. We want you to be part of our family. So our funders said we are making sure that these families are getting books and, um, you know, and, and, and we're finding ways to connect them to each other. Hmm. Oh, through these initiatives, like these Shabbat dinners? Three Shabbat dinners. Um, uh, we launched, we had a high holiday card exchange where families all across North America exchanged high holiday cards. Wow. Um, they were matched up with other families. And can could you imagine living in a place where you, there's not a single other Jew and they're connected to somebody else? I mean, I, I have to tell the amount of time I spend crying when I when I read these notes from people of just immense gratitude mm. for being connected to someone else, for reading a story again that resonates with them. It's yeah. I live. I, I feel like I have to live in waterproof. <laughs> I live in New York City, and so <laughs> I think. Um, and I also was raised in a very tight knit Jewish community. So it wasn't until I was eighteen and at NYU, which is also you know. In, in the middle of New York City and um, has a has a pretty strong Jewish population. But it wasn't until then right. that I really recognized, oh, wow, oh, like I'm a, like a real minority. I never really had that experience. Um, right. And it, it can it can feel a little distorted. I, I know even for non-Jewish people who live in New York, there's this I, I was out to dinner with friends actually all three of them have been on this podcast and they're they're all not not none of them are Jewish and they're all fabulous and they were just like kind of joking that everyone's Jewish in New York City and the truth is that's not true we're we're a minority here as well but there's a large yeah. presence and it it can feel like uh at least from where I'm sitting that like uh, uh, you know that we're not a minority or that like what's the big deal and just to be reminded that like Jewish people make up 0.2% of the population in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we're tiny, you know? Yeah. So, so tiny, but mighty. And (laughs) um, I think that sometimes that gets lost in the, in the shuffle when it comes to the, the, the conversation around Jews, you know, because there are people in different countries around the world, certainly. And even in, um, the United States that don't have strong Jewish communities or, yeah. or if they're small, they're um, strong, they're small. Yeah. Um, and they do need this supplemental support. I see Absolutely. you yeah. and I hear you and I love you and I support you. It, it, it makes all a difference. And I think especially with the rise in anti-Semitism these days, um, I think it's more important than ever to really lean into our Jew- Jewish identity and, and and be proud of who we are. And I think the books help really instill that pride. It reminds us that there are others out there. There's such beautiful stories to share. And um, yeah, it's, um, I think they're a game changer. Um, it's really hard actually to wrap my head around the rise of anti-Semitism in a conversation around our children. It is, it's really, it's really challenging. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some really great resources that can help start these conversations, but yeah, they're conversations I never wanted to have at such a young age with my kids, but you know, they're, they're seeing, they're in a world, they're, they're seeing things on TV. They're seeing things all over the place. And when my little one asked me, mommy, why don't people like Jews? Like, it's heartbreaking. 
it's yeah. heartbreaking to have this conversation with them. And um, honestly, sometimes I, you know, sometimes I don't know if I get it right. You know, I certainly try my best. Like my husband and I, we, we do our best to have these conversations and keep it as open as possible. Um, and we just choose to focus as much as possible on being proud of being Jewish, like celebrating Shabbat. Like, you know, everyone does things their own way. But, like, you know, we we come together every week. We have our challah. We have our dinner. We spend our time together. And we talk about what's meaningful to us. Um, and so we try to focus on that. But there's such difficult conversations and the questions they're asking, I feel, are getting harder and harder for me to answer. Well, you have children who are a little bit older than mine. Your youngest is seven. My oldest is five yeah. and a half. And maybe you can, and and not to put you on the spot, but maybe you can give <laughs> us a, a heads up on what those conversations might look like. Yeah, yeah. So I have, yeah, so I have um, my little one. She's going to be eight next month. I have... Um, a 10 and a half year old and a kiddo who's going to be bar mitzvah actually in January. And thank you. Um, the, the questions go all across the board. Um, honestly, the other day we were having conversation about active shooter drills and why that happens. And especially in the Jewish day school, like why they need, why they need to do this. And it brings up the conversation of anti-Semitism and, honestly, sometimes, depending on the situation, I don't always know what to say, but I, I, I do go back to the PJ books. I talk about values. I talk about the values that are important in our family and how not everyone shares the same values in the world that we do. And, um, and I, I try to shed a positive light, but I don't shy away from it. I don't, I don't believe in shying away from these hard conversations because I, I'd rather them hear it from us. I'd rather us have these conversations than kind of out in the field and them not being prepared. And because it's going to come up at some point with their friends, it is going to come up. Um, Yeah. It's, I I don't have a good answer truthfully of, of how we tackle it. It it, it changes every single time based on um, what's happening in the news, but we just try to be honest about it. We try to answer all of their questions as honestly as possible without without trying to be too biased. But it, it's hard. It, it, it's they're really, really hard conversations to have. And I don't think there's run one right way. So um, yeah. uh, also you, knowing your own children and their threshold for hard conversations totally. and your own self is really important. Um, Absolutely, but they but they hear the news. I don't know. I, 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 my kids don't know. Yeah, that. <laughs> I I know. It, I mean, it's surprising. So my my oldest, he's in seventh grade. I mean, they talk about the news every single day, and um, I'll never forget. This was a few years ago when there was the the shooting in Pittsburgh, and I re- I debated all day long, like, okay, like do I have this conversation with my kids? And because especially it happened on Shabbat. And I remember um, we had no, so we don't listen, you know, we don't watch TV or listen to the news on Shabbat. And I remember being in synagogue and we got walked home by a police officer and my kids are like, oh, this is so cool. The policeman's walking us home today. That's so fun. And in the meantime, the adults are like, what is going on? And having to have this conversation with my kiddos after, um, and they started talking about it more in school. It's like, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. How am I having this conversation with my kids? But they, they hear things. Not, you know, every family does things differently. So they hear things everywhere, um, even if they're not necessarily watching the news themselves. So it's like, how do we just prepare ourselves? Um, my friend, it's going to be a roller coaster as your kids get older. It's so much fun. But the questions they ask... Um, the questions they ask, they're not easy, especially math questions. Yeah. I don't oh, know. No, I, I like, I like it. Five plus five, 10 plus 10, 20 yeah, plus 20. Math. I mean, that yeah. I can do. Those it's are like concrete. So There's a, <laughs> well, the thing is, it's just like, no, he, you know, he'll wake up and, and, and be like, mommy, a hundred plus a hundred. So I'm into that. Those questions, those questions I can answer, but yeah. when it comes to, you know, <laughs> I'm still in, still learning about the Holocaust. My yeah. grandparents are Holocaust survivors and I'm still like, yeah. how? Yeah. And I, one day I, I keep turning to my husband and saying, like, how am I supposed to explain this to my children? You know, there was like a swastika on the um, subway the other day. And it's so awful. 
uh, a costume designer who I I've worked with before posted it on on Instagram, and I, I know that her her grandparents are survivors also, and yeah. I was just like, what do I do if I see? I mean, right now, if I saw it on the subway and my kids were sitting in front of it, I wouldn't say a thing, right? But one day they're going to know what that is. And it's not yeah. going to be like the Indian power symbol. It means something else right. in America. Exactly. And my family it's- history is fraught with um, Jew hate and the violence that we have somehow narrowly escaped. Even in Montreal, yeah. it, even in Montreal, there was a huge, maybe you can speak to your own family history, since I've, I've, uh, uh, hi listener, you've heard it all. You've heard it all from me. Um, <laughs> but um, in Montreal, from my understanding, there was a huge um, exodus from the English speaking Jewish community there because yeah. there was also a, a, an enormous amount of anti Semitism mm-hmm. um, going on. What was it, the 80s? 80s, 90s. Um, I, rem- I so clearly remember a referendum we had, I think. I want to say it was 1993, we had a referendum to see if we were going to separate from Canada. And there is this French nationalist movement. And the anti- that's, I think, when a huge number of families moved from Montreal, especially to Toronto. Um, and to New uh, York. I know and New York, yeah. Movement. I mean, it, it was really, really all over the place. And I remember having, you know, I was young at the time, but I remember having these conversations with my parents, like, why aren't we moving? Like, so many people I know are moving and my father's like, well, we ha-, he's like, I have my business here and your grandparents are here. We can't pick them up and just start all over. It's really hard. We've done that before. You know, they started all over when they came from Europe. Yeah. You know, it's a really hard thing. And um, yeah, the, I mean, I remember, being in, I remember being in university. I went to Concordia University and the rampant anti-Semitism that yeah. was there. I'll, I'll never forget um, a former, a, a prime minister, an Israeli prime minister came to speak at the university and there was tear gas. We were being, we were locked in the room for our safety. And I was like, I was what, I was like 19 years old at the time, just trying to wrap my head around like, I'm like how is this even happening? Like, I know. it was just, I don't it, know actually, I don't know. You no, know, there, there's. And especially when you're in the middle of it, 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 it feels shocking. Um, well, it feels really shocking. Well, the reason why I mentioned um, and sort of called forth your own personal history is that I didn't grow up that way. In New York, in a small, tight-knit Jewish community, I just, yeah. and I see this a lot, and, and maybe I'm optimistic or maybe I'm ignorant or whatever it is, but like, you know, I'll sit here and talk to, talk to, um, you know, amazing activists and the, um, abortion and, and, um, pro-choice space. And I'll be like, I didn't see this coming. And I know I'm saying this now around anti-Semitism, but uh, so pardon, pardon my naivete. It's it's part of, it's part of what is the truth about me, but, um, I just, I don't always know how to speak to my children about this because I just never really had to deal with it until May 2021. And even then it was online bullying that I was, not to gaslight myself, online bullying was truly, truly petrifying. But uh, I, I, I never had to be locked in a room, uh, because of tear gas. Yeah. And I was, I never had that, had that experience. But so I, yeah, it's, it's, so I, I grew up, I honestly, I grew up in a Jewish bubble. Like I went to Jewish day school. I went to Jewish camp. I did Jewish youth group. I did all those things. And it really, honestly, and I, I was truly in a bubble and it wasn't until I got to university until I, my eyes were open and I saw the world around me. And, um, I, I wasn't prepared. I remember going, I'll never forget, I remember going abroad. I went backpacking with my best friend. We were in Scandinavia. I'm the, the Rocky Jewish best friend. Um, and my so it's interesting. So she's, so my God, she's the best. So she, so she speaks Arabic. And I remember being on, um, being on a, a Metro subway. I think we were in, I think we were in Stockholm. Um, and she's like, we need to get off right now. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, we're not there. She's like, we need to get off the subway right now. It's like, okay, fine. Just going with the flow. 
I, we get off. I was like, what happened? She's like, Lori. She's like, those two guys were there. They were saying things in Arabic that I, I can't say out loud on this podcast. Like, really, really awful things. They're like, those women are Jews and we need, we need to get them right now. And I was like, what? I, I was in shock. And so again, growing up in this bubble and starting to, you know, um, encounter it more and more as I got older. And so I think it's just sometimes it's like what we're exposed to. And I just feel like, and we, there wasn't, you know, internet wasn't huge back when I was a kid. I mean, we didn't have access to all this information that people have now. And, um, that's why I just think it's more important than ever that we support each other and we talk about things freely and, um, and, and, and that we have this, I, this sense of Jewish pride, proud, proud, yeah. being proud of who we are. And, um, yeah, just really, really rough. Yeah, <laughs> it's tell. rough. It's rough. You know what else is rough yeah. is that, like, there's, um, well, that, A, it comes from all sides. Like, of course, you, you mentioned um, traveling and hearing, um, you know, these these two people speaking in Arabic and, having ill intent towards you you know there's like what what you experienced in in montreal um yeah it, it, you know there's there's right wing anti-semitism and left-wing anti-semitism and what's so oh, bizarre yeah. is that the anti-semitic tropes that would keep us trapped such as we're successful we're greedy we're might we're power hungry mm-hmm. we're we're conniving um would have have um put us in a position where we're even embarrassed to talk about it, to make yes. a fuss. We have been told, and that's a, that's a that's that's gaslighting. We have been told and uh, manipulated around a, a belief um, that we even we even broadcast. You know, on a, uh, when we tell our own Jewish stories, like if we if we tell our own Jewish story on television and in in film and in theater, yeah. there is always a slightly there is usually um, a making fun of our own selves, and I don't want to. It's self. It's like a self-deprecating. A self-deprecating. Sense of humor because, I don't want to go so far as to yeah. call it self-hating or internalized no, anti-Semitism but, necessarily, but we're all sort of like m- poking fun at ourselves um, around the Jewish experience, and I right. think so. Mm-hmm. So we sort of broadcast this to the world, and when we say mother to mother, Lori to Daniela, I'm stumped and uncomfortable. There is also a part of me that thinks, oh, wow. Like, do we have the right to say this? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah, we do. We totally do. I would say this to any, any mother. Of course you have a right to come together, band together. There's, um, there's nothing wrong with vulnerability and that, that's what we're right. really showing the vulnerability of the truth of being mm-hmm. Jewish and the truth of anti-Jewish racism. That is, that, that is still, that is still an issue and, and more so yeah. today. Yeah. I'm just, it just, it really is mind boggling that, that, that there is a self-consciousness around even expressing yeah. it when it comes to being a North American Jew. I don't know how it is in, in Europe. I know that there was a huge, exodus from yeah. france but for north american jews there is a feeling of like i don't want to mention it but ooh, right i um this doesn't feel right yeah it doesn't feel right to have active shooter drills in our jewish day right. schools yeah it doesn't feel right and we can say that point blank right but i don't know what this yeah, yeah we've in, we've internalized the um the uh the lies we've we've internalized the lies somehow. I, I, I unfortunately, in order to fit in, maybe or to and, just get yeah. Back. And I sometimes I think it's a matter of self preservation. I think um, you know how do how do we keep our, our ourselves safe in some kind of way, and we're able to do that by being self deprecating. But you know, is that really helpful? Yeah, but is it helpful sometimes? Possibly not. But. Um, no, I, and that it's, it's part of why I really enjoy the programming that you're delivering, which is for, for, for children yeah. specifically, but I really think of it in terms of like, uh, 
wow, we really don't have that representation on PBS or, um, and maybe understandably so we're a very small population. I, I, I understand. Right. But um, it's, yeah. Although Rugrats, they were in Rugrats, they were Jewish, yeah. which was so cool. Oh, yeah. That was so cool. Oh yeah. And, the, and, um, and, and, and my kids get really excited when they're, when there is like some kind of Jewish cameo in any kind of show. Um, but what you're saying, but Blue's Clues had a cameo. Yeah, Blue's Clues. Blue's Clues um, I think so. No, was it so? No, Elena of Avalor, Avalon. Uh, it was a Disney show. Oh, yeah, there, there, there was something there. But, um, but what you were saying a moment ago about vulnerability, like one of the things I really love, just circling back to PJ, is creating these. Not again, we have the books, but creating these experiences where we're connecting families to each other and creating this circle of vulnerability, this safe space where we can rumble with these really hard topics, and because. Um, and especially as parents, I mean, it's hard. Like, where are you going to go find, like, especially if you're new somewhere, you're not going to go to a bar and pick up some friends. Like, you know, where do you find grown-up friends these days? And so PJ is just, re- PJ Library is just this amazing, uh, again, it, it starts with the books, but it's a way of bringing people together and helping helping us have, at least having a support system around these hard conversations. And knowing that we're not alone. Sure. Like, for me, I feel like that's really important. Like, I'm not the only one. You know, you and I, like, you know, this is our first time chatting, but, like, you're going through similar things as I am, and having this this ability to talk about it is, you feel less alone, and I think that makes it easier, even though the topics are hard. Yeah. Easier is an interesting choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> well, more, less maybe lonely. not easy. Yeah, less lonely. Less lo- yeah, no, fair enough. Not easier, but l- less lonely, and just knowing that, like... I have people to talk to about it and, 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 and go back and forth and, and figure out different approaches. Yeah, no, definitely not easier, but it's <laughs> less lonely, I would say. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> if only it was easy. Yeah. And I think joy is an antidote. You know, when, yes. when we, um, when we published our um, first um, pride month episode, the title Mm -hmm. was pride is the antidote to shame. And I think, you know, in Hebrew, if an, if, if my Israeli father wanted to really like teach me a thing or two, he'd say, "Busha," which means shame. (laughs) Shame. You should be ashamed of yourself. Busha. He would say it to, to, to to, to me as a child, but he, but also in general, that, that is a, a curse word of sorts. Because shame, yeah, yeah. because shame is a curse. It is a curse. That's yeah. what those tropes have engendered in us. Shame. What's the antidote to shame? Pride. One of my pride and joy. Yeah. Pride and joy. There is so much Jewish joy and humor there is. and dancing and song and story mm-hmm. and creativity and innovation. There is so much to be proud of. Yeah. And my one of my dear friends is Jake Cohen, who um, is the author of a cookbook called Jewish. Oh, oh yeah, I love that cookbook. That's and great. my son loves that book. You know, he loves books, and he sits down at dinner and he reads Jake Cohen's book. And in in his <laughs> in his introduction, he talks about he had always sort of grown up Jewish, like whatever. Like yeah. was he was he observing holidays or like you know talking Talmud no but he knew he was Jewish it wasn't until he came out as gay that he realized how important it was to be proud of his gay identity for the you know for uh maybe you know gay children and and peers who weren't there yet um to be a shining light for them that he sort of recognized oh wow I'm also Jewish and my pride in being Jewish, my Mm -hmm. um, joy in being Jewish is an antidote to shame and pain in that experience too. And so now he's gone on to, you know, he's, he has this beautiful Instagram and TikTok following and, 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 and personality and, uh, and, and books that he's written around Jewish cooking and the Jewish experience. And, I, I really do find that, that these books that you're offering children, if we can have a foundation of pride of self, because, and we talk yes. about this with parenting all the time, you know, Janet Lansbury has 
all these great resources around respectful parenting. And one of the things that she always talks about is like shaming children is a motivating force. They, they will follow your rules if you shame them, if you, you know, it, right. But it's not a way to build confidence and it's not a way to build nope. agency, sovereignty, a, a sense of solidness in the world. What we do, what you do at PJ Library in offering from the youngest of ages a pride of self, a pride of heritage, yes. a pride of legacy, of tradition, what, what, and of choice. You can do what mm-hmm. you will with this pride, but just having it from the very beginning is such a beautiful foundation it makes such a, it makes such a difference um and i think it helps parents like give helps parents have talking points to you know for their kids like i always said um i remember when i first interviewed for this role years ago i said to um our president i said for at, at the end of the day for me you just need to know that pj library is a partner is a partner in my parenting it's like a tool in my toolbox and even though Again, I did Jewish day school. I did the whole thing. Like it, it helps me every single day have conversations with my kids. It helps me feel being proud. It helps my kids. And so it's, it's truly, even though the books, you know, are for kids, they're, they're really for oh, everyone. I find children's and, books um, to be like very moving. They're amazing. <laughs> all, no, like, all, thank you. All, all children's books, I find the good ones are for me. T- I mean, I like, I know Dr. Seuss has like a bad rap these days, but I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy it. Yeah. And I, I find a lot of um, joy in, in snuggling up and reading with my children and having shared experience. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, I have been such a proud uh, recipient and um, ambassador of PJ Library. I love that. As have my kids. I love that so <laughs> Almost much. Unknowingly, they, they're like they just you know they ask for it all the time. Um, That's the best. Yeah, it is. It really is. And um, I'm grateful for your work, and I'm grateful for this conversation. Thank, Thank you. you for having. This has been wonderful. Um, I PJ is my passion, so I can. Uh, Anytime I have an opportunity to talk more about PJ Library, I'm happy to. It's um, it's really powerful. It's 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 really amazing. And I'm so grateful to Harold Grinspoon, the foundation, and all of our incredible funders and our communities for making this happen for all mm. of our families. How can um, our listeners follow you? Follow PJ Library. I know you said that like it's for people raising Jewish children, but I just want to give a plug for if, if you've gotten this far in the conversation, friend, thank you, first of all, and hi. Um, but secondly, I mean, they're great books. So if you are curious about um, Jewish tradition, living culture, these, I don't know, I, I would say sign up. That's, that that yeah, would be my plug. And- yeah, or I'd say another alternative. Um, we have on the, the the big store online where you purchase all the things. Mm. Um, we do have a PJ Library store on Amazon, so you can purchase books there. And so many of our other books are also available for purchase. You can find them in libraries. Oh. So even if you're not necessarily um, a monthly subscriber, um, you can find we have so many resources online, and there's other ways to get the books. And um, yeah, it's. Uh, Lots of options. Oh, great! So, how how do we um, find you? And, so yeah, um, so you can yeah, so you can find you can find us pjlibrary.org. Um, we are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We are we are pretty much we're we're not on TikTok, but we are on. Uh, you can find all sorts of information um, online. You can sign up. Sign up pjlibrary.org. Um, it's really easy. If you have any questions, our customer service is incredible. Info at pjlibrary.org. Um, and, and yeah, and you, you can find me on Instagram. I, I, I hover there every so often. I'm more of a voyeur. I like to check out other, <laughs> I like to check out, um, other people's platforms more, but, um, pop on and say hi to me if you'd like. Well, then if, if you want that, we'll need your handle. Please. And thank you. Yeah. It's Lori. It's my name. It's Lori Hawk Stiefel. I start, I, it's really boring. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or you can find me at the vegan Balabusta. That's also my other handle. Oh, well, there you go. That's fun. Yeah. 
Um, well, thank you so, 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 so much. And thank you for it's listening. It's awesome seeing you. Yeah, you too.